Banerjee has clearly stolen any thunder that I could offer. So let me twist it, <coughs> apart from being short. Can, I can, anybody, can everybody see me? So I think that, uh, you know, let me give a different slant to all the sections and the challenges. And uh, uh, I think at the end of the day, it's what the young girl said, right? It is a state of mind. And I think that all these rules and schedules are really to try and reinforce you from being naughty, bottom line. Uh, and uh, I remember when I was a young uh, counselor and I just came back from New York, I started in the bar and you had no conflict as a barrister, right? You were killing somebody on one point on Monday and you were killing somebody for absolutely the opposite point on Tuesday. You had your brief, you fought it out, you did your best job, you marked it, you sent it back. So when I transformed into a, an m and lawyer and not a counsel, you suddenly had these questions and this conflict check you had to send out to people that work with you. Do you have a conflict representing this client? Do you have a conflict representing somebody else on this issue? And I remember in the first six months, I phoned my father, uh, who's a senior, and I said, uh, Papa, you know, this conflict thing is very difficult because just used to fighting for every case you get. How do you deal with conflict in these sort of situations? So he said, if you don't like how you feel about it, it's a conflict. <laughs> and, you know, I sort of carried that thing uh, right into the tender age of 62. Uh, but I think that's ultimately what will cause an arbitrator to self-behave, right? And there are a number of things that I think we can do apart from the fifth schedule and the seventh schedule. One is perhaps the sixth schedule, which Siku said how many arbitrators fill out unless they feel a need to. Maybe there's a reason for every arbitrator to fill out and say it's nil. Please, he signs off and he says I'm not too busy. And then when you find he's giving a date after six months, nine months, uh, he's kind of got the wrong notion of what not too busy is. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing is, you know, a little bit of naming and shaming isn't a bad thing, actually. Um, if an arbitrator gets his sense of uh, conflict wrong, uh, tell me how many people or how many instructing lawyers or counsel are going to put their hand up and say, I think you're a really biased guy, you know, and uh, hell, I'm going to put it right now. It may be a Schedule 5 problem, but, uh, and I may have to go through the whole arbitration with you and see you smile at me for the next one year. <laughs> I'm telling you I'm going to challenge you as soon as the award is out. <laughs> Clients going to say, get on with it, see ya. You know, forget it, we'll deal with it. Many challenges just don't get made, believe me. They just do not get made. Um, we were in an arbitration where suddenly there was a change of counsel on the other side and one of our arbitrators said, oh, I must let you know he represents my family and distant family in some matters, uh, so I'm letting you know. Did we challenge it? No. Why? We couldn't deal with the repercussions. <coughs> so in these cases, uh, don't expect the schedules to actually achieve the result that should be the right result. The right result is arbitral conscience. It is for the arbitrators to set themselves a higher moral standing. And I'll tell you why it's not just a fairy tale. It's like, you know, your mother teaches you honesty pays, but market standing pays. Uh, there are arbitrators who we have, uh, we have nominated who have absolutely rightly gone against our client. We deserve to lose. And we probably appointed uh, the same arbitrator in another matter. Uh, one of my juniors, I remember, came up to me and said, he wrote such a bad award against us. And I said, what's bad about it? It's right, it's just a bad client. So you basically get the market standing in the community, which is then the real shield from a challenge. So, according to me, the state of mind of the arbitrator, so if, to your to, to God's uh, issue of repeat assignments, for God's sakes, if an arbitrator has got 20 opinions he's given over the last year and taken five appointments of arbitrations for that client in this year, you're doing yourself a disfavor. You may, you may think you're independent, but the rest of the 
world doesn't. So why are you getting into that space? So I think, you know, you really need to be busy. You don't need to be silly. And if you're good, you're going to be busy. You don't have to worry about anchor arbitral clients. The, the community comes to you. Uh, so according to me, the schedule of the arbitrators, which is in the sixth schedule, should be made less than optional. You should be disclosing. To my mind, the entire community should be bent on a little bit of over-disclosure. Nothing wrong with over-disclosure. It is your best protection from a challenge as an arbitrator. And again, you know, you're putting the disputants uh, and the parties before you uh, in a clear conundrum, a clear conundrum. So you're supposed to challenge quickly. You're supposed to challenge without undue delay. You're supposed to challenge exactly when you come to know. If you don't challenge under four, you're going to waive it. Under five, you can, you know, agree to waive almost anything. So it's all right to say this is what the law says. On the ground, when a matter is going on, when the stakes are high, and these three guys are going to decide your fate, and the challenge from that is very limited, you are not beating off anybody, okay? And your advice to your client is swallow a lot of this because what you get if you don't is going to be worse. So I think that it then ends up in the conscience of the arbitrator. And that is the conscience that you must keep refining. One way to do it, as uh, LCI has done and in the morning, I think you or uh, Ajit were talking about is to have all the challenges which are published and the reasons given for it. Uh, subject to how to preserve confidentiality. That is not a bad thing because it lets arbitrators know what is on and what is not on. And that is not at all a bad thing. And with the evolving uh, commentary and uh, uh, community which is developing in this space for challenges, as God have said, challenges, of course, I mean, if a Jan Poulsen is resigning, it's a huge thing. And if all the other arbitrators, why are they doing that? They're not doing that because they like to resign. It's worse if you are appointed and you resign because you're already tested out there for the conflict. And what does the resignation show? It means you obviously did not think it was worth breaking out the conflict. <coughs> and that there was enough of a little bit of a fire to get on with life and get off that panel. And you are busy anyway, right? But do any of the arbitrators that Garov has named have any less market standing of the five he's named? Absolutely not. Would you go back and swear by all five of them? You would. Why? Because their market standing is such that they have invested in the community opinion of who they are, what they are, and what they stand for. So I think that what we need to do is actually educate our arbitrators. And the problem is that because a lot of them are former retired judges, it becomes very difficult to have such a frank conversation with them. Uh, there's too much formality and, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's too, uh, how do you call it, it's too difficult to say something very frankly, except to the ones, has, as I say, who get it, right? They get it. They get that they need to be on a community of an arbitral uh, institution and standing where everybody is talking good about them. The last thing you want to hear when you go to an ICA or a conference somewhere else where they say, oh, anybody who's pointed from India, don't expect him to give a decision against his party. That's not good to hear. That's just not good to hear. And I just don't think it's right anyway. If you are a judge, you are deciding against one of the two people in front of you. It's fine if you do the same. So, and if you don't get repeat business, it's fine. You'll get the business from the international community who's going to recommend you the next time. So, I'm not sure that in real terms, if you really take the repeat business argument forward, it should be a problem for anybody who's good. And that's biting the hand that feeds you again. I, I think you can overcome that. It's sensible. I think you will get more work if you are just a better arbitrator. Um, 
So now let's look at how the issue conflict is resolved. I struggle with what Shavak says. As being a judge, Shavak is entitled to change his mind. And when he does, his lordship pleases, right? But as an arbitrator, when you've expressed a very firm view in certain cases, it's difficult for the party who's arguing exactly the opposite view in front of you to feel that sense of confidence. Some arbitrators actually disclose their issue conflict in advance uh, and leave it to the parties to decide what they want to do. Um, again, I think that uh, if you have the Schedule 7 test, I don't think it covers the issue conflict test. It's a wider test that goes beyond that. Uh, you now look at the new proposed bill which has gone through the Lok Sabha and is coming up uh, in the Rajya Sabha, which is just last month or so. Uh, you talk about you know having a accredited arbitration uh, committee, etc. And you talk about who, which arbitrator will be empaneled with that. And that is supposed to be the future pool of arbitrators, if you like. Well, have a look at that draft and maybe the judges here can give some input. If you look at the qualifications of those arbitrators uh, or to, to be qualified on a panel, uh, it's basically a few experts, lawyers, judges, accountants, lawyers, judges, accountants. They have to know what the constitution is according to those guidelines. Now, you know, you need to get a pool of sensible people. Uh, you need to look beyond just judges and seniors for your arbitral pool. I think the arbitration process in the West is much more successful because they genuinely look for people who are experts in that field. Today, as a result of appoints, so, so what's the classic? Someone's appointed a chief justice, I can't appoint a non-chief justice. Third party has to be a super, super chief justice. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Uh, and, and when you say, well, you know, this guy is really good, it's okay, he can be the chairman. You look at it as if you're a complete idiot. You just don't get it. And because there are these two chief justices, the chairman will be overwhelmed. And he will do whatever these two chiefs say. And this poor guy, you know, and who's the stronger chief justice among this? Because, yeah, oh, Dusen is the other strong chief justice from you know, This is the mentality, right? So we have to grow, and we will grow. I agree with Fali, the future is bright, but it is still a journey. And again, on the interlocutory application uh, challenge, I agree with Gaurav. I think I was on the Law Commission with uh, Justice Shah, Dinaiz Kamart, and I. And uh, a lot of this, uh, really, I think what was passing through the Commission's mind was the delay. The, the real uh, fear of delay, uh, of running off to court, uh, for every challenge. Uh, here's one. Oh, I just found out about another one. Here's a third one. And, you know, patting yourself on the back and saying, Dekho, Grant, go to So, so I think that was the real fear. If that can be resolved by the challenge being looked at uh, by a uh, institution, maybe that's a solution. But look at it practically. I'm challenging your appointment on my panel. And there's a provision which says, you know, continue the proceedings while the challenge is going on. You think I'm going to appear before you while I'm challenging you? And you think my client wants you to appear before you while you're being challenged? But it's not practical. It's just not practical. Uh, so I think that, you know, either, according to me, either the challenge has to be going to the root of it, um, either you get the arbitrator uh, somehow to disclose what you think the issues could be. Uh, or in real terms, in many cases, in real life, a lot of challenges just don't get brought to the table. So uh, apart from HRD and, uh, you know, Nariman's uh, uh, ability to allow us to go to court in a Schedule 7 offense, like a Schedule 7 challenge, I think Schedule 5 has been seen as a guide, it's been pronounced as a guide, it's a softer test. Um, we are not getting into the other issue, which is 
the ineligibility of a nominated arbitrator to appoint somebody else, which is the TRF decision that we were talking about. Uh, and of course, the distinction which has been made by the Delhi court uh, as to whether a person who's not nominated as an arbitrator, uh, but to your point, uh, an unequal appointing party who can say, okay, I'm not going to be the arbitrator, but he's going to be the arbitrator. And if you don't like him, lump him. Uh, and if you really don't like him, challenge him, and then you see who I'm going to appoint next. So, uh, so I think these are uh, the few points that I wanted to raise. Uh, uh, not exactly a reading out of the schedule. So I think that uh, you know, part of it is the fault of our community, the instructing community. Um, we tend to go to the people that we are comfortable with. Uh, not that we believe that they will be on side, but we just think they're sensible people who will get on with it. Maybe we need to recognize that we don't want to put our arbitrators in such a situation. And we rethink uh, the regularity with which you go to a couple of arbitrators and expand the arbitral bench, uh, uh, which is good for everybody. I think that arbitrators need to take a deeper breath uh, on the assumption that they are more under the spotlight now than they were before, uh, that communities are looking at them, that judges are looking at them, that they are named uh, in judgments. Uh, what if those uh, challenges had been upheld? That would look pretty bad. Uh, and then the sequitur of raising a wrong challenge is money. You got to pay. You got to pay for being naughty, right? So if you raise a challenge, and you lose, then there should be a huge uh, consequence which the, 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 the court puts on you by way of an indemnity for costs. You've wasted everybody's time, you've mm. delayed the whole matter, uh, you've tried your luck, you've taken the gamble, as they said in the morning, and you've lost. Well then, take your wallet out. So I think that if we have a few checks and balances, and we have, uh, Again, as uh, your mother says, fear is good. Fear is good. Everybody should be worried about their market standing, about being named and shamed. And I think if the whole community gets together that you want to do the right thing, um, I think a lot of these five and seven and, you know, uh, all motherhood statements uh, just become practical realities. Thank you. All right, so Mrs. Modi, fear is good. You put the fear into me at least. It's on one side, and Mr. Banerjee on the other has, of course, taken a very different view on this issue. I, I see where he comes from. I don't think, I mean, there's one thing I, I had in my note which I did not mention is that when we have these rules and regulations, you cannot have it on the basis of an individual's perception or an individual's experience. It must be far more broad based So I accept that. And I think uh, Mr. Akshay Ban was sitting over here from the Punjab and Haryana High Court must have been very happy to hear both of them. And I think I took a view in one of his matters contrary to what... No, we have to ask him. Let's be asking the question as well. So, would, let me invite Mr. Ban to make any comment that he wants to on the issue. I already made the argument there. Oh, okay, all right. All right. All right. Now, let us welcome questions from the. Uh, yeah. Anybody? Yes. I have a very basic question something that all three of you actually deliberated upon. In fact, I would want all three of you to give your comments. This question uh, relates to the disclosure. Now, I think uh, while you're tenured as the Chief Justice of Punjab and Indiana, you delivered a judgment wherein you said that uh, if there is nothing to disclose, no negative disclosure is required. That is one extreme. The other extreme is we have arbitrators who actually, mm -hmm. from Schedule 5 and Schedule 7, mention everything and say yes, no, not applicable. That is the other extreme. What is actually a balanced disclosure, or there is any sanctity to this, this disclosure clause or the Schedule 6 that has been introduced? Because I do not see any consequences of not giving a proper disclosure at all, neither by our courts and nor by any institution uh, presently in India. 
but let me just start. I mean, despite my judgment, I have actually been given the disclosure. Even if there's nothing to disclose, saying that there's nothing to disclose, probably err on the side of safety. And now let the panelists uh, let go first on this question. Um, actually, this was um, if you look at uh, Chubb judgment, is exactly what the court said that uh, there was nothing to disclose, so there was no problem. But as you saw in the facts of that case, uh, there was something to disclose, according to me, that he had accepted two, uh, two arbitral appointments as party arbitrator down the line. It was relevant. So, to answer your question, which I, I mean, question one is how much do you disclose? I mean, that has to be a common sense approach. You. Uh, there are two extremes. You know what you should disclose. As an arbitrator, you you should act uh, reasonably if you have done some other case. So and err on the side of caution. But more uh, problematic is your second question. What is the consequence? I have a problem. There's no consequence. Consequence is <coughs> challenge when you discover <laughs> and challenge and you wait till the end. That's the real problem. But even, even the first step of a proper disclosure would uh, kill off 90-95% challenges. So in fact, uh, most arbitrators usually have, I mean, due respect to the good ones, uh, the same template, they do not really feel that there is any need to apply their mind when they have to give the disclosure. They'll just copy paste from their previous order and I'm sure 80% of them have not even read what Schedule 5 and 7 says. So they simply say that there is there are no circumstances uh, that will affect my impartiality. That's a cultural thing. Yeah. I think we'll have to. Yes. Achieve. On the consequence, I think one way to look, one way to look at it may be that you know, all arbitrations are based on contract. Right? Even an arbitrator is, in a sense, a contractually agreed uh, position. And if you breach that, if you don't give the disclosure, the disclosure that you should have given, it's really a breach of your contractual duty to do it. And if you there's a breach of contract, it can be a termination in terms of termination of the mandate. You look at very simply, everything is contractual in, in an arbitration. So if you find there was something which ought to have been disclosed, like your H versus L or M versus L, then if he didn't disclose that fact, although the court there found that there was nothing, I think that, that's not the way to treat it. I think the way to treat it is to say you didn't disclose it, you are in breach of your contractual duty, so in fact now a statute is in fact, even if the statute was not there, I think that duty was in, that duty lies in every arbitrator. There's an old judgment of Justice Jagla, beautifully written, where he says an arbitrator is has to act in good faith and there has to be complete underpellies in his you know in his actions. So I don't see whether there's a statutory breach or whether you call it a, a contractual breach, the result should be the same. He shouldn't have just said that, look, it doesn't matter, there's no real problem with it. There is a breach of contract. See, good, that won't hold. Because once he's appointed as an arbitrator, and he doesn't think he needs to disclose, there's no breach of contract from his side. And the only one who's going to test whether there is a breach or not is going to be the court. Yeah, that's what's like 14. Yeah, you have so, to go 14. Yes, yeah, so exactly. But then that's beyond. One of the, one of the audience... One of the audience members suggested something which, you know, is interesting to moot, which is that should an arbitrator, when he's being appointed, mention whether he's been the subject matter of any challenge in the past. That might, might, might be an interesting way to start fleshing out. Uh, you could have a challenge for frivolous reasons. You could have a challenge which, which is not in bad faith.